Amen, amen. Please be seated. Our morning scripture today is going to be in 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verses 17 through chapter 6, verse 3. 517 through 63, 2 Corinthians. This is one of my favorite passages, so if I get a little shaky here, please forgive me. 2 Corinthians 5, 17 through 6, 3. Therefore, if any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. Old things are passed away. Behold, all things are become new. And all things are of God, who hath reconciled us to himself by Jesus Christ, and hath given us the ministry of reconciliation. To wit, that God was in Christ, Reconciling the world unto himself, not imputing their trespasses unto them, and hath committed unto us the word of reconciliation. Now then, we are ambassadors for Christ. As though God did beseech you by us, we pray you in Christ's stead, be ye reconciled to God. For he hath made him to be sin for us, who knew no sin, that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. We then, as workers together with him, beseech you also that ye receive not the grace of God in vain. For he said, I have heard thee in a time accepted, and in the day of salvation have I succored thee. Behold, now is the accepted time. Behold, now is the day of salvation. Giving no offense in anything that the ministry be not blamed. Amen. Well, good morning. It's good to see everybody here today. Once again, we're able to gather together in the Lord's Day and participate in the Word of God. Participate in worship by way of a singing, and even in the music that we sing, there's a sermon in those songs that just remind us so much of God's kindness, His grace, mercy, truth, and a whole lot of other things. Well, today, as we look at this text of Scripture, we're going to be on the subject of the, the integrity of, the, of church ministry. The integrity of church ministry, just how important is it that the church be true to the, the content of the gospel message? And we, see, we can see this in uh, Paul's writing in this text of Scripture. So Charlie has already read the text, so let us open up with a word of prayer and, and then look closely at it. So, Father, once again, the very inspired words of God are now in our presence. And we do thank you that you have kept these words for us even to this very day. What was written back in Paul's time in the very early days of the church still finds its place in our lives. So we ask that uh, you would uh, help us to to reveal that to us, make the application to our individual lives, and even to our entire ministry. So guide us in this by your Spirit, we pray in Jesus' name, amen. So we need to get a little bit of a background as to what is happening here because there are some phrases that uh, Paul is using that should raise a question in our mind. For example, uh, let's say in verse 20, he says, We are ambassadors for Christ, as though God did beg of you or beseech you by us, and we pray you. We're begging of you, we're exhorting of you in Christ dead, be reconciled to God. Now that statement, if we look at it from the standpoint of the uh, the urgency of the gospel message being preached to the world, is, is an absolutely true statement. As a matter of fact, the entire context there up to that point, Paul is reiterating the importance of the gospel and uh, the fact that they, we now, he and his team and all churches, are to be the ambassadors, the spokesmen, the representatives of that gospel message. And so there seems to be a certain turn, there seems to be a certain uh, twist that has taken place next when he says, you be reconciled to God. Now, if I understand it correctly, he's writing to the Corinthian church. He's writing to a body of believers, those that have received Christ as their Savior. So why would he be saying to them, you be reconciled to God, almost as if to say, you be reconciled to God the same way in which the world is to be reconciled to God. So why is that so important that those words be stated and directed to the church? In other words, it's another way of saying, 
we have a responsibility to be reconciled to God. We just have to understand in what context, in what way does he mean that. Well, to give you a little bit more background, we have to remember that uh, when Paul writes to the Corinthian church, it wasn't the pristine church of the, of the Middle East at the time. We just briefly, we know that it was fraught with problems. They had immorality in the church. They had issues with uh, who is the best preacher. They had a grading system where a, guy, a, a man would preach and they'd give him a, a scorecard and whether they'd invite him back or not. They had a, an issue of uh, neglecting the poor, holding a, a, a service in honor of the memorial service for the Lord's table, and the, and the poor people were kind of like left on the outside. And then they had idol worship that was in there and the, uh, uh, the, the case of unforgiving spirit, and so much more. That's why 1 Corinthians and 2 Corinthians, uh, Paul deals with these subjects. So when you hear all of that, now it kind of gives you an idea of what he means by the fact that you be reconciled to God. In other words, they had issues, they had sin in their life. There was a practices that were taking place that required them to return to Calvary and not find salvation, but to grasp and embrace the terms of salvation. That is, God pardons, and it's necessary that you fully understand that, and there are going to be times in all of our lives, we have to go back to the cross and seek the same kind of forgiveness that we ask for in order to be saved. The difference is, it, we are estranged children, and we're coming back to now the Heavenly Father, and we're asking Him, and we're seeking His pardon on the terms and on the basis of the shed blood of Jesus Christ. So it's the church returning to the roots of its life, that is the gospel message. And once that is established, now the church can be on its road toward integrity, and that's were the, the primary theme of this paragraph that we're looking at here this morning. So I want to give you three thoughts. And I, the idea of, of keeping church ministry, the integrity of church ministry. And when I make that statement, where we, we, we have to be able to qualify what is meant by ministry, what is meant by a minister, and uh, what do we mean by the idea of integrity. So we'll look at that, but here are the three major thoughts that we're going to look at. Number one, we're going to have the declaration of integrity. And you're going to notice I'm going to start at the bottom of the reading and move backwards. The declaration of, the, of integrity is found in chapter 6, verses uh, 3 and 4. And we'll, then just to read those, giving no offense in anything, that the ministry be not blamed. The ministry be not blemished, but in all things approving ourselves. And the key word there is approving ourselves. So the declaration of integrity. Paul says, I want to see a good, robust, solid, uh, Bible-believing church that is true to the ministry of reconciliation. Second observation this morning is going to be that of the effective work of grace. Once again, moving backwards, the effective work of grace, where do we see that word? We find that in verse 1 of chapter 6. We then work it together with him. We beg, beseech, exhort you that you also receive not the grace of God in vain. So we, we have to examine the word grace. Thirdly, our third point for this morning is to the call to the church to be reconciled to God. We have this calling. There is this begging to be reconciled to God. So you kind of like go uh, to the end of the third point, say, okay, God is requiring, asking, calling out to, for the church to be reconciled. Why? So that we go to the, back to the first point, so that you can have a ministry that is pure and true and faithful to uh, chapter 5 of 2 Corinthians. We then as ambassadors and God to witness that God sent his son, God through Christ, who was in the process of reconciling the world onto himself. So that's the integrity that we're dealing with. And in order to have that, we, we work this process and we find in the end, the only way that we're going, we're going to find ourselves true to the true meaning of the ministry itself is to find sure our hearts are right with God. So let's go to the first observation, the Declaration of Integrity. 
And uh, here we find in verses 3 and 4, giving no offense in anything, that the ministry be not blamed, but in all things approving ourselves as ministers of God. You have a negative and a positive. The negative side is that we're very careful that there's not anything that happens, anything to prevent, anything that we want to prevent the ministry from having a blemish, from being tarnished, that a false accusation could be cast against it. But in all things, whatever we do, approved, God likes it, it's tested, it's the way God wants it to be done. So there's three questions that we want to ask as we look at this. First is, number, is this, what is ministry? Secondly, how can it be blemished? And then thirdly, what is the minister of God? If we really want to understand three and four in respect to the declaration of, of the integrity, we have to understand what we mean by those words. You take the word ministry, and if I say to you, we have a ministry of South Day Baptist Church. In one sense, we use that one word to capture everything that we do. It is like the, the essence of the church. It is there in, a, in the fullness of all that the Bible has to say and the various ways in which we uh, take, make application to our individual lives, to the lives of other people, over at the school, even working, doing things, service, all of that. We could say that falls under the context of, quote, ministry. And so people are ordained into the ministry for example, and uh, we say we do ministry work. But there, will be, there needs to be uh, the understanding of that word and how Paul is using it if we want to realize the importance and the value of it. So we want ministry to have a very clear definition in this passage. And, and I would submit to you that it, it begins with the, the content of the message itself. In other words, as we read backwards, we find that we have been given to this this ministry, we've been committed on to us the word of reconciliation. We go back uh, to verse 18, that he has reconciled to himself and given unto us the ministry of reconciliation. So we find that Paul is dealing with words and actions that have to do with the subject of people being reconciled to God. So the whole idea the very content is this. God is the reconciler. Because we find that in verse 19, to wit that God was in Christ reconciling the world to himself. So God is the reconciler. God acted, in verse 19, through Christ's death. He's the one that initiated the plan. He is the one that uh, acted through Christ. And it is going to be that through Christ alone is the only means of reconciliation. So now you get some idea of the content. God is the author. God acted. And now God acts through those, us, who have been reconciled. So the primary author and player is God himself. That is the part of ministry that we have to maintain a, a good integrity. That gospel message, that content, can in no way be compromised or changed. That is the, the story that is there. So this is what the content that makes ministry. We keep that thought in mind because we have various ways in everything that we do that we are making it possible for all things to be funneled back down to this very fundamental, basic imperative, and that is for people to act upon God's reconciling work through Jesus Christ. And so ministry can be from the broadest sense of the word, and but when we narrow it down the way Paul is talking about it, we have a word of reconciliation, and we have the ministry is rec of reconciliation. So just remember that. God is the initiator. He worked through Christ. His interest is in the world. And we then, who have received that reconciled status with God, we act as his ambassadors. We are the ones that are called then. He uses us to act through us to speak this ministry, this truth, this content to others. Under the same idea, that was our first question. The second question is, 
is, or a statement is this. That is why the, the ministry cannot be tarnished. So the question was, how can it be blemished? Well, it can be blemished when we fail. Understand this. When we fail to live as reconciled people, we then are certain uh, culpability there for blemishing the power and the strength of the reconciling work of God. What takes place? Well, what takes place when God reconciles an individual to himself? He acts, he calls, he sets up the terms and conditions through Jesus Christ. When an individual comes to know Christ, we find ourselves back to verse 17. Therefore, if any man be in Christ, he is what? A new creation. Old things are passed away. Behold, all things are becoming new. So, when God reconciles an individual to himself, there is a, an act of transformation that God installs and institutes into the believer. When an individual fails to embrace that and act upon it, in other words, his lifestyle does not give credence to the new creature in Christ component of the gospel ministry, of this message. And so when there's a lack of of concrete evidence of transformation. It raises the question to the onlooker, I thought you said Jesus saves, Jesus changes, but there's very little difference that is what has taken place in your life. Now furthermore, when you l listen to what Paul's writing, he's writing to a church. And in that church, there were matters of d grave concern that he's trying to uh, deal with. And that is, you've been reconciled uh, by God, you are new creation, but their life as believers within the context of the church itself was not giving evidence of new creatureliness, of transforming their lives. So therefore, he can honestly say, you need to be reconciled to God, because the evidence of being a new creature are, are lacking. As a matter of fact, as a result of that, you find yourself being uh, drawn away by idol worship. You find yourself being drawn away by pride and envy and strife. You look at so many things that seem to be more inviting. And uh, so you, you, you go, go back to God, go back to the cross. And understand that when God set forth and instituted and acted to save man, he did it so that you could be that new person, the new creation. And so we, in that sense, when we ask the question, who is a minister of God, that puts all of us into the category. We are all ministers. We are all the, the servants. The, the minister in this biblical sense is the fact that this spokesman, this individual that is serving the Lord and carrying that message. We might have also say this as part of ministry as Christ, as God, through Jesus Christ, deeply involved and engaged himself into the sinful world. He put Jesus into our world of disharmony, ugliness, anger, and strife, and enmity with God. Christ came into this world while we were still yet sinners. And so the minister, the ambassador, is going to find himself diving deep into the ugliness of society with a message that promises to give hope and can change their life. But in order to be able to do that, he, we as individuals have to fully understand that this reconciling work of God is something that has to be adopted into our life. It has to be the mainstream thought of our life. I am a redeemed child of God called to serve. That takes us then to the second point, the effectiveness of the work of grace. In verse 1 of chapter 6, he says in, uh, at the end of the statement that you receive not the grace of God in vain. So, tells us immediately there, there is the message of grace, and it is to be received. So, the reconciling work of God offered to the sinful world, man re has the responsibility to respond to that graciousness that God sent Jesus to die for your sins. So remember that, keep that into the background. Uh, that that uh, in verse 17 and 18, God, through Christ, 
made him to be sin for us. So this is grace. Grace is this. Number one, that God acted in love. Now this is part of this, this ministry. God acted in love in the midst of our hostility to bring that to an end and replace it with peace. So here's an act of God's love to a, a, uh, a horrible, ugly world. And uh, he comes to our hostility, and in doing so, he brings about the potential for peace, depending on if an individual is willing to reserve, uh, receive the, the terms of God's grace. It cannot be by any works of our own. It can't be any effort of our own. It's simply coming to Christ and saying, listen, I understand. As a sinner, I am deservant of an eternal damnation, and here is grace given, grace offered. God takes the first step, because we don't have it within ourselves, to come to the Lord, and so here's grace. God is acting in love to come toward us in our hostility so that he can now bring about peace. So what happened there at that point in time? Secondly, he mended the broken relationship. He mends this broken relationship, and we, he justifies us, in other words, puts us right with him. He mends a broken relationship when he justifies us through faith. Now we're back over to man's responsibility. That is, we come to Christ and we come to the Lord and we say, by faith, I accept. God acted in love and entered into this uh, relationship with me. The only way he could do it is he'd have to just defy the sinner. And justification is by faith. For by grace are you saved through faith and that not of yourself. Therefore being justified by faith. Romans 5.1. So here's the broken relationship being mended. And thirdly, we have God now as the judge and he enters into a personal relationship with the defendant, with the accused. I may have given you this illustration once before, but let me share it again because I think it's, it's great. So in a typical court of law, if, uh, if the judge uh, acquits an individual for his crime, and even though he may have deserved some kind of punishment, but out of the graciousness of the judge, and the jury, the judge says, this man is not found guilty. He can go back to his life. And the, the acquitted is, obviously, you'd be just overwhelmed with that. And you'll go about your life. And you'll never want to see that judge again. And that judge will never want to see you in his courtroom again. But yet, the judge justified, set this man free. He was pardoned for his crime. But at that level, a, a, a normal judge in our society, anywhere, is like, I'm done with you, don't come back, make sure you live right. But when God, as judge, enters into the relationship with the accused, he not only redeems him, but he enters into this re personal relationship where now the judge becomes your friend, where the judge for your crime now becomes your savior, your father. So the depth of that is overwhelming that the same God who accused me has also now pardoned me, and not only is he set to be free, but now he offers his acquaintance, he offers his spirit, he puts me into his family. I'm adopted, he becomes my father. I am a child of the king, I am a child of God. I've entered into a relationship of grand inheritances. So this is all part of this grace. I had to build that word up because it, we sometimes, we use the word enough, it's like words lose their meaning just be through repetition. But when we talk about God's grace in the, in the context of God acting out of love toward a hostile world in order to bring about peace, not only to bring out peace, but to bring about relationship of friend, of father, of savior, and a provider, and so much more, that's all wrapped up and built and packed into that word, word, the grace of God. Oh, unmerited favor, true, a very simple statement. It is. 
But what is in the background of all that unmerited favor? So those are the three thoughts when we talk about grace. Some uh, application from that, we say, so this grace in vain is not a question. Receive not the grace of God in vain. It's not a question of its effectiveness to save. God's grace is very efficient. It is sufficient to save. When an individual receives and calls upon the name of the Lord and knows that in his heart there's nothing ever he is going to do, you can improve your life all you want. You can be the best person. You can read your Bible. You can pray, go to church. You can belong to a Baptist church, a Presbyterian church, whatever you want, but without Christ. And so when an individual says, I understand, not of works, but strictly by your grace, your provision, that individual is the individual that is going to be saved. God's grace is quite sufficient. So it's not a matter of a question of its effectiveness. It is whether we have worked out this grace into our lives. That's the question. In Philippians chapter 2, Paul makes this statement uh, that by way of his redemption, the work that God started in him, he is going to work it out to the end. He wants it to reach a conclusion. In other words, salvation by faith, transformation, godliness, the new creature, Paul says, in my life, I want to be such that as as he would work on a mathematical equation and try to make letters be numbers and numbers be letters, and in the end, build a spaceship. That's what Paul has in mind. That kind of arduous work and labor in his life. So he that started the good work in you will complete it into the end. So this is the not receiving the grace of God in vain. 1 Corinthians chapter 15 and verse 10, Paul talks about for for. By, I've been saved by God's grace. But God's grace was not given to me in vain. It wasn't purposeless. He says this, but at, with this grace, I lay, or labor more than they all. He says, I labor more abundantly than they all. In other words, all the apostles, all the people have received God's grace. It has changed their lives. They are saved. They are rescued. But Paul says, here's what I do with God's grace. I labor with it. I'm doing something with it. And that's why he can call to the Corinthian church and say, look, you make sure that in your life you've got this wonderful gift and all the, all the components and all the details of it. You make sure that wonderful gift is not wasted. You make it work. And primarily, how do we do that? As the reconcilers. The reconcilers to God first because of our sin. The reconcilers toward one another because we are all sinners living under the same roof. And we're going to tick somebody off. We're going to offend somebody. We're going to be offended. And this was happening in the Corinthian church. Be reconciled to God. The foundation. What happened there is everything that we've just said. God makes the first move. God did the first step. Go back to him and receive forgiveness and pardon for our our immediate sin. And then, as a result of that, we realize that we have been saved by God's grace. And he would enjoin us to also offer that same spirit of forgiveness to one another and to others, even those others that are outside of the faith. So it's this grace in vain. It's not a question of its effectiveness, but it's a question of its application and a pursuit of it. It's a matter of urgency. Secondly, it's a matter of urgency. You can't omit. You know, oftentimes you wonder, you read verse 2 of chapter 6. He says, uh, following on the heels of, do not receive the grace of God in vain. For he has said, I have heard thee in a time accepted. And in the day of salvation, I have succored thee. I have encouraged thee. Behold, now is the accepted time, now is the day of salvation. Why is he quoting this passage out of Isaiah? What does that got to do with God's grace? Because there was a time in Israel's history that they cried out to the Lord. And you, you see this several occasions. <clears throat> but <clears throat> Paul, the writer, Isaiah, is reminding the people that God is right there. And at this accepted time, He said, in the day of salvation, 
I encouraged you, I brought you in. So Israel, now is the day, now is the accepted time. In other words, seize the opportunity. He's taken the Old Testament truth as it applied to Israel. He takes it and uses the same idea from that context and brings it to the church. He brings it to us. And he's telling us us, <clears throat> telling us this, this grace that is free <clears throat> and has behind it the, the work of Christ, God reconciling through Christ the world unto himself, is something a matter of urgency. Do not neglect it. Don't wait for another day. You know what, I think when I get older, I'll just be able to uh, maybe improve upon this grace in my life and be a reconciler and, and really pay attention. Don't waste this time. The theme of that verse is the urgency of the moment, the priority of, of applying the grace of God to our lives in, in our immediate context of where we live and what we do and how we are thinking, in particular, the, the maybe perhaps sin and, <clears throat> and distress that is in our lives. So it's not a matter of, of efficiency, but application. It is a matter of urgency and priority. It's another way of saying this. By the end of this sermon, if I don't put you to sleep, you're going to leave here with the idea, now is the accepted time. Right now. This is an urgent matter. And we you stop and think about it, God's grace is an urgent matter. The price that one individual would have to pay, Christ, taking upon himself the sin of the world, he who knew no sin became sin for us that we might be made the righteousness of God. This great exchange. So that makes it urgent. That makes it something that has to be carefully protected. That's why it cannot be blemished or blamed. That's why the burden of responsibility is on each one of us as believers. That we live a life that is in accordance <clears throat> with the, the work of grace in our lives. So that brings the end of the second point. Let's go to the third point. The third point is this, the call to be reconciled, that the ministry be not blemished. In a way, I've sort of like addressed it by allusion to this, but it's found in verse uh, 20 of chapter, or excuse me, we're still, we're at this point, that the uh, ministry be not be blamed, blemished, but there's this call to reconciliation found in verse 20, be ye reconciled to God. Now remember, you want to be reconciled to God so that you maintain a ministry that is true to the preaching, true to the effect of being reconciled to God. You have those two components. True to its urgency would be your third one. So that God speaks, man has responded, and so here we have this integrity that we are trying to maintain. Sin entered into their lives, sin entered into the church. We get to chapter 7, we get to chapter 8. He's dealing with uh, a whole host of other issues that are happening there. But the problem was they were not running with this grace. They did not seize the moment and the word and apply it to their lives and to other people. That was what was absent. That's why the call is there to be re reconciled back to a right relationship, an effective witness. But at the same time, it is not to neglect the urgency of a call to the world. So here's one of those passages of scripture that has a double meaning within the same context. And the double meaning is this, that Paul speaks about the gospel beginning at verse 17 and this is the, the word and the ministry of reconciliation, God acting through Christ. Christ is the only way of salvation. But then when he boils it down, he says, okay, we're going to take that same <clears throat> truth. And I want you as a church to listen to those same words. Don't think that because you're saved, you're not obligated to uh, being restored back to God. Don't think that just because you're saved and your sins are washed away, that you do not have the responsibility to be accountable for your sins. That's his point. And you want to make sure that you seize the moment, the urgency of the day, 
we might say, is to keep those kind of short accounts with God. And when it comes to an individual that is still outside of the faith of Jesus Christ, that even an understanding of one's own idea of what it is to be saved, it's a, if it is not consistent with what Paul has already explained to us, in other words, if it's any other way other than that God invites us through Jesus Christ to be saved, there's an urgency that is there to work on it today. I'll give you an illustration that the older people uh, would understand. And I, I use this with the uh, elementary chapel. So I go up to the VA hospital. I give them credit for this. They're very thorough. They want to it's almost like they look for something wrong with you so that they can fix you. But nevertheless, in the process, there's a thoroughness that is there. So I go up to dermatology. And when you're bald-headed and you live in Florida, you always have the potential of some kind of skin cancer that is going to arise. So I go into the dermatologist, and a very nice young fellow there. And, um, and I knew, you kind of, after a while, you know what they're going to say, and you play your own recording of it. Yep, same thing as what I heard last year. So we, he does all that, and he says, well, he says, I see on your record that uh, you refused treatment for precancerous cells. I said, that is true. The lady was very kind about it. She explained it to me. She gave me this gooey stuff that I'm supposed to put on my head. It burns for like three weeks. And I asked her the question. I said, what is the possibility of what are called precancerous cells that are actually going to become cancerous? And she said, it's less than 10%. I said, you know what? I'm going to take that risk. And so I walked out last year. I come back in. The guy says, listen, they've changed the way that they do it. You don't have to put this gooey stuff all over your head. It's not like your whole head's going to be on fire. We just pick the certain spots. It's a whole lot better. I raised the same question. I said, what is the possibility? He said, well, it's like less than 10%. But he goes, let me go speak to his boss. So this lady comes in. She's been well experienced. And she kind of like knows what this guy's going to say. I heard him talking outside the door. And she walks in. And she says, yes, it is there. And it is true that it is, it's a, the a possibility is less than 10%. And she goes, the fact of the matter is, we don't even have an agreement on that. And I said, look, I've lived a life that works this way. First, number one, we're old people. And we're like old trucks. After a while, you know, things begin to break down. And it's just not worth investing money to try and keep it running. There's going to be a day it's going to the graveyard. I said, that's the first point. And the second thing is this. If it's not broke, don't fix it. My dad taught me that. I was out on a tree working on my 1949 Chevy engine pickup truck, and I'm running it, and I'm tweaking and turning, and he, Dad comes out and says, what are you doing? I said, well, I'm tuning it. He says, it's not broke. I said, leave it alone. So that's my philosophy. And it, and it worked well. You see, on those matters, we can take the risk. We can make the decision of what we want to do, on, <clears throat> in this case, the precancerous skin treatment. And everybody has the option to be, to be able to do that. But when you talk about eternal life, when you talk about salvation, that's not something that you look at in percentage points. It's not the same. So if I say to you, now is the accepted time, now is the day of salvation, now is the time when you want to come to Christ while God, grace, this window of grace is still here. Now is the urgency of the moment. This is the day. You do not have the opportunity, you do not have the freedom to ask the question, what are the possibilities that I'll miss the boat? <clears throat> what are the possibilities that I might be more right than what God thinks I am? What are the possibilities that he may give me an exclusion clause? or an exception clause, there are no such questions. It's a matter of now. It's for every unsaved individual that comes within the sound of this message this morning. Today is the day. You have to seize it. You can't ask, well, what are the chances, the possibilities? How long will I might live? You can't risk another day. And that would be one of the ways we'd apply that idea <clears throat> Well, I might live to be 70, and there's going to give me another 40 years where I could make a decision to trust in Christ. You don't have that option. What is guaranteed is this. Number one, God provided the way of escape. God provided that. 
Second guarantee is this. If you don't seize the day and, and accept the, now is the accepted time for salvation, you will, at the moment of death, not have a second chance. It is appointed on the man once to die, after this the judgment. Those are the very gracious terms, information that God has given to us. So yes, the way is made, and yes, once that door is closed, it's called death. There is the guarantee. There is no percentage point. There is no, you might be one of those few that are up there in that other category that just made it. That's, that's not the way it works. Now is the accepted time. The urgency for the church is the maintaining of the integrity of the preached gospel that it so changes our lives that we find ourselves wanting to be true to God's message and make sure that as the world sees us and as God looks at us, he sees hearts that are being daily reconciled to God so that the ministry, that entire content of the message is not blemished, but maintains its pureness and its integrity. Let us pray together. Our Father, we do ask that on this day, <clears throat> we would find ourselves coming before the throne of grace. And in one sense, the, the sinner and the saint, the saints that are sinners, all of us can come before the throne of grace. All of us, Lord, can find grace to help and mercy <clears throat> in our time of need. For the individual that is apart from Jesus Christ, not been redeemed, not has asked Christ to, to save him and rescue that same throne, Lord, is where grace can be issued out and pardoned and received by trusting in that death of Christ for his place. And then for us as believers, we go back and we are reminded that we are still sinners saved by this same grace. And we would plead that same blood in the confession of our sin so that, Lord, we can have a pristine message that is demonstrated by our lives and our ability to be able to proclaim it to others. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.